Welcome folks to our third night of the Labor History, Labor Studies Lecture Series. I want to thank all of you for, for participating uh, and giving your time and energy and sitting on your tuchises. That's a uh, Yiddish word. If you don't know what it means, look it up or look it down. Uh, but I want to welcome you all. Thank you so much. Um, remember, this is a uh, student-focused public lecture series open to public um, participation. Uh, we have a really, really wonderful um, roster for you. We have songs, we might dance a little, uh, and we have an absolutely fabulous speaker. We have uh, my good friend Michael Johnston from Grand Rapids. Uh, he's a fabulous labor historian, a teacher, an activist. Now I want our minds to be still for a moment and to take a trip back and to imagine that we're in the old organizing days of Irish labor. I think I hear Hold a song the fort in the air. cause we are coming. Union folk be strong. Side by side we battle onward, victory will come. Well, it's good to see you all here today. Good to My, be here. I'm not sure I can talk to all of you. I'm just a simple Irishman from the County Cork. But it's good to see all of you here, and I hear your brothers and sisters are here to be inducted into the Union. Well, which of you here can hold a hammer and use a hammer? Raise your hands. Good, come on down here. Which of you can put electrical wires up? You know, it's a newfangled thing here in this 1911, but I know you're good at it. How many of you do the electrical wiring? I need you down here. Come on down here, boys. Now we have a problem here, boys. You know, this is 1911, and I gotta tell you, I know someday I'm gonna make a prediction. Women, and I see a bunch of you here, you're gonna have the right to vote someday. It's gonna be tough, though. But men, we've got a problem here. You know, I bring you greetings from Sam Gompers, that good man, head of the AFL. He'd be here, but he's dead. So anyway, I'm here, and I'm going to be swearing in. I've been invited here. So could I have a couple people down here, the ones that use the hammer and use the electrical? But we have to make a vote. Now, some of us, some of the unions that belong to the AFL, they don't allow women, and they don't allow people of color. But I could tell you Sam Gompers does not like that. So I'm going to invite, I'm going to let you decide in this. How many would like the women, the sisters, to be able to be part of this brotherhood? Raise your hand. I'm glad to see that now because, you know, Sam Gompers, he was telling me just the other day, he said, I love that Muskegon. They used to float the timbers down. It was where the nights of labor began. He said, I remember when I was up there, they had the great union cigars up there. They had the great union beer. I'd have some now, but I had to settle for water. And you know what they say, wine is for wisdom, water's for bacteria, and beer's for courage. And right now, I don't have a lot of courage in front of you folks. So, so how, we, well, we just voted on the women, didn't we? Okay, people of color. How many of you to people of color in the brotherhood? All righty. I'm glad. I'm glad you're all with the progressive spirit. So, I may point to you because it looks like we have a very fearful crowd here tonight, but don't worry. Don't worry. Do we have any of the Irish ancestry here? Ah, good. 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 You wouldn't happen to have a little bit of nip, would you? No. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> I need a little courage here. Do we have any of the Polish ancestry here? Ah, good. Well, forget you because we're Irish. Do we have anybody else from Europe here? Ancestry from Europe. And where are you from, brother? France. Oh, France. Well, I got to think about that one. <laughs> okay, I got to think about that. I don't know where to French. Okay, who else do we have over here? Italian. Oh, Italian. I know some of the Italian brothers on the east side. All righty now. Where are the brothers that come on down here? And I'll tell you what we're going to do. Well, you know, this is a brotherhood and a sisterhood here. And you know, not anybody can join the brotherhood or the sisterhood. They have to be a good mechanic. And they have to be vouched for somebody. They have to ask to come in and join. And then we vote on them. And you know how we vote on it. You all know the, you know the rules, but I'll just go over it for a minute. 
So you remember this, lads? This is a ballot box. Now this one's fairly recent. I think this was made, you know, just a few years back, about 1880. And so we have the little white marbles in here. And we all know what the little black marble is. So basically, we gather around here, and this is quite a big union membership here. I think the biggest I've been to is about 100 workers. And we gather around, and then the person who's to be nominated is escorted out. And the brothers and the sisters, they stand up, or you can sit here and say why that person should be in the brotherhood. Are they a good worker? Are they a good mechanic? And like the young lady here, she obviously, she's Irish, but she can load her liquor. See, she's not even staggering. I guess she's just sitting. So it's okay as long as you don't drink on the job. I mean, after all, if every Irishman was told he couldn't drink, I don't think we'd ever come to this country. So anyway, so while you're all sitting here, so I understand you, lad, are the one that's going to be joining the union tonight. Is that correct? Oh, and, and ma'am, would, would you escort the worker out here so we can talk about him? My knees. Oh, well, that's right, ma'am. Who can we? All right. Would you escort the worker out? He's a sergeant in arms there. You see Come his on, arms? Boy. There we go. Stand now, up if you don't boy. mind, you could stand up and just talk loud. Do you all know the worker here? Now, he has to be on the outside, sergeant in arms, so he doesn't hear us talking about him. Because we might say bad things about him, but hope not. So, do we have any fellow workers here? What kind of worker is he? Because we don't want slackers to join the brotherhood or sisterhood because they make us all look bad. I'm sure you know that. Yes, sir. What do you have to say about the brother? He's a good guy. He holds his liquor. That's good. All righty, that's good. That is very good. What else? What else? What is that, sir? He beats his wife. Ah, well, we don't care what he does off the job. How is he on the job? He's He's fine. He's fine. Good. Another brother says that. What else do we have? Do we have a sister? Yes, yeah, sister. He's slothful and he loses his uh, tools. Ah, that's not good. We can't have that. You know, when we get those contracts, and we don't get contracts yet, but that's another thing I'm predicting. Someday we'll have it in writing. Now we just do the handshake. Well, okay, that's not a good sign. Is there any other brothers and sisters? All right, I'm going to go around. Now, this is a big meeting tonight. Now, remember what you do. You take it out of here. White means you accept him into the brotherhood, sisterhood. Black means he's been blackballed. That means he can't join for a while. Okay? And what you do is you put it right into this little hole. And then when it's all said and done, we'll bring the brother in. And I'll, I'll look at it and we'll tell him whether he's a member or not. Is everybody with me? All right. You sure you don't have another, you don't have a drink somewhere, do you? All right. I think I'm going to do okay. All righty, I'm going to go around and I'll probably skip around so all of you. Let's start back here, my friend. All you have to do is take one of these and put it right in there. And I see a brother here works with me with Sam Gompers. He's from the bricklayers over here. Good man. But have you heard the good news? The boys in Grand Rapids are holding out. I just was there. Now they've been on strike now for over three months. And you remember, you've been reading it here in the papers in Muskegon. They're trying to get the nine hour days at 10 hours pay, but they're holding out. They've not had one cross the picket line. And you know, it's quite, quite something because you know about Grand Rapids, you know how it is over there. All those Dutchmen over there, they're all Protestant. They're not like us good Catholic Irish. But you know, the good brothers, the Polish and Lithuanians, they're Catholic. And they went all out together. Of course, they don't like to stand next to each other and talk to each other, but they know a good thing. So they've been holding out. Of 
Carson, it's <coughs> I sure do need that. I, I do need that liquor. The courage is rapidly running out. <laughs> well, well, absolutely. <laughs> no, scotch is not one of them. That's for those English bastards. I know many of you came over on the starvation ships. And you remember what that was like. Those English bastards, they took our land and they let us starve when the potatoes went bad. Where's the other color? <laughs> Excuse me. And I'm going to quickly jump up there since we don't have enough here for everybody. So we'll just have to go with how many there is. <laughs> okay. I abstain. Okay. All righty. Now I'm going to look at it now. Okay, would you bring the brother in? All right. Brother. Is, is he in or is he out? Do I have books around his ears? All right, brothers and sisters. I'd like to welcome the new brother to it. Did the brother oh. Let's give him a hand. Oh. Yeah, there we go. So, brother, do you have anything to say to your fellow union brothers and sisters? Are you yeah, Irish now? You must be a little, uh, you no. need... No. German descent. German descent. German. Do we have any beer in the house? Uh, sir, we've, we've got some beer in the back, but oh, it's well. rather warm. The boys so what do you have to say, right? brother? Uh, what? What do you have to say, brother? Well, I have to say, I have to say that um, I say that the next step for the unions is to uh, unionize the unskilled laborers. Oh, thank you, oh, brother. Thank you, brother. That's nice to rouser. hear. Now, friends, my name is Michael Johnston, and I'm a retired teacher. I taught for 19 years with high school students, and it is a delight to be teaching um, or preaching, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> adults. Uh, this is a, probably a relatively recent ballot box, but they haven't changed much. You can see the label of the Carpenters, so this was actually made by a Carpenters member. And I suspect, just from the design and everything, this is probably from probably the 50s or the 60s. I did have one that was a hand-shaped uh, uh, thing here. Now, by the way, who put the black ball in there? <laughs> so you did uh -oh. now, brother. Now, wouldn't you know it? Since I was in control of who gets elected or not, did I pay a little fancy? Did I play a little fast and fancy with this? Of course, that never happens in organized labor, does it? Aww. So in real life, that was called blackballing. And we know what happened later. It came from labor to companies. When you were blackballed, you were what? Marked. Okay. Yeah, basically you were marked. Over here at Brunswick Balky, this was the amalgamated woodworkers over here. But uh, they, th that's who it was originally. It was basically a German union, and then they united with the English-speaking workers, and they organized this place over here. But the Carpenters Brotherhood raided that small union and took it over. They went riding on bicycles through all of Muskegon and all of the towns saying that Brunswick Balky was scab even though it was another union. You know about this inter-party stuff? Same like this. So as a good union leader, I decided that the brother was good, and I chose to overrule the majority. The bottom line is that labor, organized labor, is democracy. It can be the worst, it can be the best, but most of it's right in the middle, just like anything in democracy, okay? All right, I was told to come in here. I don't do lectures, I do reenactments. I have a little thing that I've just developed over the years. First of all, uh, I'm still learning how to use iPads and stuff like that, so I don't have it tonight. A little bit about my background so you understand where I'm coming from. I, do we have any 23-year-olds here? Anybody 23? Dear, when I was 23, I was going to get married. Actually, at 21. 23, yes. And I've got to remember, now it's a long time ago. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sadly, now I'm history and it worries me. Anyway, uh, I was going to get married and uh, I, had come, I had been born Catholic and grown up in foster homes and orphanages in six states and 32 addresses and blah, 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 blah. So I didn't even know who I was. So I went into this room and they said, this is where you go to prepare for Christian marriage. So I walk in, there's a film going, I sit down and I see these policemen beating up farm workers and I think, geez, 
if this is what's marriage about, this is what I grew up with. Well, it was the wrong room, but the right cause. And it was Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers. And how many of you are old enough to remember the Boy Cups of Grape, Lettuce, and Gallo Wine? Good. Good. So I walked in and I was hooked because I, I grew up poor. I come from a fine white trash pedigree. And uh, my grandmother was a cotton mill worker, started working when she was 14 in South Carolina. My dad grew up in the Great Depression. So anyway, <clears throat> I got hooked. I went out to California. And if we could get this, I'll just try to get this. I went out to California, and the life-changing event was this. We got paid $5 a week in room and board, if we could find it. We found a house near Disneyland. We worked 60 hours a week. The overhead. Well, we're going to use this right here, just this right here. Oh, just the this. Part. We'll start with this one. Yeah. Because then we'll get right into history. But I wanted to tell you how I got into this at 23. So, anyway, I'm standing out on the highway, and our job was to convince voters to vote for Proposition 14. We had signs that were about 10 feet tall because we didn't have the money to go on air. We wanted it to be allowed that organizers could go in and talk to Hispanic farm workers who lived on company property because we couldn't get at them. And I have a picture of one of the villages. So we were trying to get the voters to vote Proposition 14. How have you been to California? OK. California, LA. Do you know LA? Nobody walks out there. Everybody drives. Imagine big orange sun rising over the landscape, commuters driving in from 50 and 100 miles away, five-lane highway. Zoom, zoom. We're standing along the road. There was 100 of us about, 10 feet apart, 50 on one side, 50 on the other. People are going by. We got our signs. I think mine I was holding up and I think it said, uh, Governor Brown says yes on 14. People are zipping by. They're going, and they're going, and we're going, because we were taught not to get nasty. Well, I'll never forget this, and I very much fear Alzheimer's, but I know this will stay with me through all of that. I saw this white car, a little white Toyota. Back then, the Japanese cars were very uncommon. It comes driving up. Stoplight's right there. It drives up. And for most of you folks here, you don't remember this, but in the old days, back 30 years ago in 76, they used to roll windows down. <laughs> My students didn't remember that, so. Anyway, I see this car come up, it stops. I see the woman lean over, and she starts rolling down the window. And for you folks who are ancient like I am, do you remember what that usually meant if you were standing on the road and the car kind of moved towards the curb and were rolling down the, what did that mean? You're a youngster, you know your history. Or herstory, what, what does that mean? They want to talk to me, and that's what I thought. So I took my sign, I laid it down on the pavement, I had shorts on, imagine me 30, 30 pounds lighter, because you don't eat very well when you're making five hours a week. I turn around and I, I come down, the window's down by this time, and just as my face came to the window, I saw her hand go to the glove box. She opened it up and she pulled out a pistol and she pointed it at my face about that far away, okay? She points it at me. Now, what I do remember, my students would ask, well, did you jump at her? Because that's what they do in the movies. Did you strangle her? <laughs> no. Did you, did, I said, well, good thing I didn't eat that morning because you know what would have happened. <laughs> I just stood there. That gun was in front of me. But I do remember she had a nice blue blouse on, nice blue skirt, looked very suburban, maybe upper class. And this is what I do remember. She had hair kind of flipped back. And just this last presidential campaign, she looked identical to Michelle Bachman. Maybe it was her mother, her grandmother. <laughs> anyway, she pointed that gun at me. I stood there looking at it. And it was forever, at least an hour, while well, it was the time of the light to change from green and red. And I vividly remember her taking the gun, putting it in the glove compartment, patting it, and driving away. I'm still here because of that. Because at that moment, shortly after, I had to make a decision at 23 years old, newly married two years, was I willing to die for a cause? Hell no! But it made me realize there were people willing to kill somebody else over ideas. I don't know what her issue was. I still don't know. I was so stunned. I stood there. I didn't even have enough 
thinking to look at the driver's, the license plate, because that would be a what today, an assault, wouldn't it? So I remember that. So Cesar Chavez is dad, and I'm still here, and that's what motivates me, because there are causes, and there are beliefs that are very powerful. So I wanted to share that just that way, because that will probably be the last thing I remember before the whole memory goes. Anyway, so let's talk about a little bit about these people who died for labor, because people are still doing that. Now, you folks covered last week. Let's do some quick, uh, quick bringing back. Somebody help me out, help me out. I don't know anything about labor. It's about lazy people, isn't it? Can you help me out? Where did it begin? Lazy, Jamestown. lazy people, where's that? Jamestown. Jamestown, 1607, anybody been there? Anybody been there? They just dug it up. They found the fort and everything. Yep, the glass blowers going on strike. Polish glass blowers. See, we don't talk about the Polish because they came here and we're already striking. Okay, Polish glass blowers. What else? What else do we know? What else do we know? Where do we go from there? That's 1607. <laughs> What's that? Slaves. Slavery. Free labor, free men. Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, um, you know, exactly. You know, the Republican Party grew out of the know-nothings who hated the Irish, but the one thing they hated more was slavery. Not because they were particularly loved people of color, they just didn't want temps taking their jobs because beginning of, before the Civil War, Frederick Douglass, he was paid wages. He came home and put it in his slaveholders' pockets. The early workmen's party said, no, they're threatening our jobs. Free slaves are taking our jobs. Okay, what was the biggest one? This is out of my tray here, but I think you can see it a little bit better. Anyway, that's what I have. It's a ribbon. It's very fragile. It comes from Grand Rapids. It's the only ribbon I know of, of the May 1st uprising in the United States. I just contacted Christie's about it at the auction house to see. I also have the newspaper account of this. It was issued by a store on division in Grand Rapids, 3,000 ribbons. It was because Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids, conservative Grand Rapids, my thesis is called Non-Union Grand Rapids, 150 years of the big lie, and it's about this thick. Do you think it was subtle enough, the title? And I went out to document it, how it's not that conservative. Anyway, they issued that ribbon, and the marchers took those ribbons, and they put them on their shirts. And the eight-hour day was like an uprising. And the unions of the time, I will show you after this, Terence Powderly, he said, oh, I love the eight-hour day, and then sent out a letter to all the Knights of Labor, the largest organization at the time, Huge in Muskegon. It started here in Muskegon, the Knights of Labor. Huge group. It actually started in Philadelphia, but one of the biggest groups here is in Michigan, um, Muskegon, and then it went to Grand Rapids. He said, ignore it. It's too radical. But the other workers loved it. And so on May 1st, 1886, Philadelphia, New York, Milwaukee, Heartland, Chicago, and I'm going to argue in my book, the first city of the eight-hour day, Grand Rapids, Michigan. They issued these ribbons. This is the only one that I know exists in the whole world. And then, of course, May 4th, somebody threw a bomb, and it was a you know eight-hour day rally, and then the Knights of Laborers got painted with it. They quickly declined. May 1st, May Day disappeared. The communists took it over, made it a holiday. The rest of the communism is gone, but the rest of the world sells May 1st as Labor Day. We're the only ones in the world that don't celebrate May 1st. But that's proof here in West Michigan, and Muskegon was celebrating it too, okay? So you get to see it here, and unfortunately, I'm, you can even see the pin that says jobs, peace, equality, and it says International Working Day, May 1st. It is the global Labor Day except in the United States and I think Canada, okay? And that is such a horrible, 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 um, while we're at that, can you see up in the top corner up there? Do you see where it says textile workers, I am for eight hours? So when, does anybody here, you know, if you were my students, I'd be having, I had prizes and candy. There were high school students, but they loved that. Pezzes, they love Pezzes. <laughs> Don't they? I wish, I'd see, if I'd known, I'd bring the Pezzes. Does anybody know when legally the United States got the eight hour day, it was written into law? Now, you know, I never picked on my students. I never said, no, nope. I would do it. I'd say, now, brothers and sisters, help that person there. Don't let them hang there. Okay, so I'm going to pick on him. And then, okay, all right, take a guess. When did we legally get the eight-hour day? And don't let him struggle here because we're all together in this. Help him out. Take a good shot. 20th century? 
sometime between 1600 and 2010. Okay, it's 1600 and 2010. We're narrowing it. Can we narrow it a little bit better? You know, that's a good guess because if you will go up there and show you, that's a good guess because one of the unions did, the mine workers declared we're going to have the eight hour day and they enforced it and I have one of those pens. Oh, hold on, hold it, hold it. Okay, hold this thought because we're going to have to jump around a little bit and at any time stop me if I'm talking too fast, okay? Because I tend to do that. Without my liquid courage, I just... Shoo. All right. The eight hour day officially, legally, this is going to shock you. 1939. Isn't that shocking? I mean, this is the United States of America. They tried it at May 1st. Grand Rapids got it for a month and then the uh, manufacturers started backsliding. And so from May, June, and July, there were strikes and everything, but we lost it in May. Then Sam Gompers said to the United Mine Workers, are you strong enough? Can you get the eight hour day in the mines? And they did. And I have a pin with that on it, if you'll keep going. Yeah, we'll just race through that and race through that. Oh. Right back, back. Do you see it? April 1st, 1898, eight hours. They got it. That's an original mine worker's pin. And I'm damn proud of that pin too. And then you see next to it, January 1st, it doesn't have the date on it, but that's the typographical union. That was in 1906. They were strong enough to get the eight hour day. So now you know proof certain that organized labor got the eight hour day. So next time you tell them, you've seen it here. And if they don't believe it, you have them call me and I'll chew them out, okay? So right there. But most workers weren't organized and were not able to get it. In 1911, when these furniture workers struck, they were trying to get the nine hour day at 10 hour pay and they lost. And that was 1911. So the struggle for the eight hour day, just the eight hour work day was horrendous. That's just eight hours. Now, what are we doing now in the year 2013? Which way are we going? Less hours or more hours? Yikes. Now, I want you to notice something else here. I do, um, I have a, a program that I do called Frankly Speaking, and normally I start with, I normally, that's all right. I hit it by accident. I normally start with Benjamin Franklin. I read somewhere on a Tea Party site that said, don't talk about Franklin, he's a socialist. So immediately I had to go and look at Franklin, see if he was. And yeah, kind of. But he did form the first union in North America, Franklin Typographical Society. He had the strikers of 18, 1786 at his house. Well, if you look at this pin far on there, it shows the US Capitol and says Washington, DC. What you can't see, now it looked good in my camera, what you can't see this is local 102 or 106 of the typographical union. Before it was part of an international, it was a local union, 1815. This is a direct descendant of Franklin's typographical society. What's my point here? Remember we said unions are what? Democracy, aren't they? Well, here's a direct tie-in all the way back to Franklin. And in your notes that I gave you, did you see, I want you to look at something, and this is what we call critical thinking. Look at those early dates, and tell me something you draw a conclusion from what I gave you there. But somebody had a hand up, please, help me out here. Hand, yes ma'am. It was called the Franklin Typographical Society. And here, oh, the date. Well, it was 17, it was shortly after he died. He died in 1787, about three years later. And here's the evidence we have. We know he had the strikers of 1786 at his house. There were 30 of them, six shillings a week. We think he wrote the bylaws, it's his style, but we can't absolutely prove it. But by 1790, 1800, there are a bunch of these little printers unions all across the country, Philadelphia, Boston, and this one, this 1815 one was. And they all said in their notes, we go back to Franklin, okay? So I gave you a lot of stuff in here that you can look up, but what do you see there after the Constitution? Something keeps on popping out at you. Philadelphia, and what else will happen at Philadelphia in the very beginning? What is the big thing that we all love July 4th? What is that? What happened in the city of Philadelphia? 
on that early Monday morning in that, you all saw 1776, right? What happened in Philadelphia? What was written there? Well, we had a Declaration of Independence and what? They started writing the Constitution. Now, if you look on all those dates on there, what did those folks thinking? Suddenly they got political rights with a tyrant named George III. They got a Bill of Rights and a Constitution laying out all their political rights. What did they immediately get from that? They've got political rights. What did they get? Philadelphia. What did they think? Who can also be a tyrant that has absolute control over you? Sir? The employer. The employer. And you can see it. Philadelphia, Philadelphia, Philadelphia. Because what did they do, sir? They did strikes, didn't they? Now, they're not unions yet, but they're striking. See, they made that connection. Don't you let anybody ever tell you that unions are like fascist or they can be, because democracy can be, but they grew out of a sense. Political freedom, economic freedom, and there's the evidence. Philadelphia, Philadelphia, Philadelphia. The printers printed it. They read it. They struck. How's that? Is that a good stopping point right there? You're such a good audience. This is not at all like my high school students. Okay, so that's that. All right, so you see the pins right here. Let's go to something next. I love visuals. I'm a visual learner. Of course, you, you know, this is not in order, and I really apologize because I'm still... Um, let's go to May Day. Now, two years ago, the young Wobblies in Grand Rapids, because there's been a Grand Rapids branch of the Industrial Workers of the World since 1905. That's on your sheet. They came in 1905. They collapsed. They came back in 1908, started again until 1914, and then they revived in 1990. They held a May Day celebration in Grand Rapids. These are picking up across the country. We're trying to reclaim what we created. We started it. And you should be proud. Muskegon, Grand Rapids, right along this coast was May Day, Knights of Labor. This city, 1884, was one of the heartlands of the Knights of Labor. When they were doing those timbers down into the big bay there, those timber workers were the first knights of labor. The knights of labor began in Philadelphia. It grew very slowly because it was a secret society and you had to have all kinds of secret passwords. But by the 1880s, it was open and Muskegon grabbed it and ran with it. And then it went over to, uh, to Grand Rapids. And at that time, Grand Rapids, from 1884, to about 1895 was the Union City in Michigan. Now you take that and you tell those Detroit folks to stuff it. About 1884 to about 1895. And I love that because we have a brother here from the Bricklayers, Local 7. Nine, nine sorry, I always get it mixed up. Nine. But originally, Local 1 was formed in Grand Rapids. I got all their notes and minutes and stuff. They were Local 1. <laughs> That means they were the first in Michigan. And when they merged, guess what city grabbed that local one number? Politics, brothers, politics. Detroit, Detroit. <laughs> Sorry, I get kind of crude sometimes, but it really aggravated me because it changed history. Okay. And it's still aggravating. It's still aggravating. You're going to find surprising things about this west side of the state. How many of you have heard over here, this is a very, not Muskegon, mind you, I love blue Muskegon, but outside of Muskegon, Ottawa County, uh, how many have heard, this is so conservative, unions have never taken hold here? No? So you're in Muskegon. You'd hear this in Grand Rapids. It's one of the myths. It's not true. Whitehall, Montague, Muskegon, Grand Rapids, Knights of Labor. Did you talk much about the Knights of Labor? Like two slides. Got into 1886, Haymarket, August Bees and the others were, were hanged, killed, and then Altgeld uh, pardons them and were done. That's and, it. And well, you. they were unique. They shot up. They started out very small. Grand Rapids had 11% of it in 1884. Grand Rapids elected every city official, county official, every elected official was a member of the Knights of Labor in 1884. They dominated the town. And then by 1886, they hit the peak and they just went down because of Haymarket. They were an amazing organization. Anybody can join except for lawyers because everybody knows they're crooks. Saloon keepers, because you know what saloon keepers do. And landlords. But other than that, you could join. Even manufacturers could join. And lots of politicians join. It's a model that people are looking at again. 
I want you to hold that thought. They're looking at it again because it was a consumer society. Consumer society. Now, you saw me wear a hat. In those days, from about the 1880s on, you knew which class you were in. You were either the vast working class trying to organize a decent living eight-hour day, or you were the wealthy, the 1%. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. That's like today, isn't it? Okay. Well, anyway, you can tell where I'm coming from. Anyway, I want to pass this hat around. I understand your professor has a wonderful hat. This one's stiff because of old age. Be gentle to it. You can wear it. But you'll notice in it, it has the Hatter's Union label. A good union man would not be caught dead not buying union cigars, which were made in Grand Rapids. I have two boxes because they were cigar makers. Your hat was the Hatter's. So I'm going to pass this around, and when you put it on, it's a real, it's the way I do this, you put it on and all of a sudden, if you're not pro-union, it's just going to shoot waves through your body. <laughs> okay, here we go. So we'll pass this around. You may try that on. Be gentle, though, because I, I, you can see the labels right here. So there you go. You bought union label stuff. The era from that time, about the 1880s, till about 1910, that actually meant something. Manufacturers actually approached unions and said, we'd like to advertise in your journals. And when a union called a boycott, and the Knights of Labor were the best ones doing it, the manufacturers quaked. It meant something. Yes, ma'am. Yes. You know, what they did in those days, how they did it, because, of course, people didn't make a lot of money, and the dues were very small. The Knights, uh, the knights of Labor, I believe, were not even 10 cents, 10 cents a month, but that's a lot when you figure people were making 40 cents a day. And so what they did is they said, you sign up members, you get a commission. So they'd have these people rush in, sign everybody up and their brother, and that's how the numbers shot up. And that's how they did. But also it was because this idea caught on. In 1884, the Knights took on one of the biggest railroads. It was the Gould system. It's on your thing there. And they won. Up to this time. Here, I want to tell you something. You can write this down. Most unions throughout American history lost their strikes. How did they start? Like the, the printers. Hey, guys, come on out. Come on, come out. All right, you come out. You stay out for a day. A week, two weeks, because you don't have any money, you don't have insurance and everything, and then you go back. Strike collapses. People get tired, they get weary of the long hours, the low pay, they strike again. And this was it for like a hundred years. Call them out, strike. Then they started putting it together. We're kind of slow that way. Maybe if we link up in the cities and do citywide, and that's in your 1830s, the workies. Let's get together. But even that isn't strong enough. It took a while before they finally figured out they have to work together. Okay? But the night spread by word of mouth. The timbering was a horrendous work. Very, very destructive. And ironically, you know what it was? It was hours and wages. Did they care about uh, safety back then? No. Nope. They thought it was inevitable. You lose a hand, you lose an arm, what, what the heck? <laughs> they didn't even try that. But they figured if they could reduce the hours, they could reduce the time. Have I said anything you haven't heard yet? Because anytime you want to jump in, okay? Because I'm not used to doing this style. I'm used to a very hands-on, okay? All right. Now let's go from that. The nice thing about the Knights of Labor, look online. A lot of people are looking at this again. It was a consumer society. It was a boycotting society. It was a labor union. But the reason it collapsed is because in Grand Rapids, you know the eight-hour, the Haymarket thing? One of the guys in Grand Rapids was on the jury convicting the Haymarket pe people. He's going to be in my book, L.V. Moulton. What was he, a patent lawyer? How did he get it? I don't know, but I know he didn't think like working people. He was the conservative side of the Knights of Labor. And then there was the radical side. And they were all in that same group together, and that's why they couldn't hold it together. The trades pulled out because they said, you're not looking out for us. The Liberals of the day pulled out because we don't want to mingle with these people who can barely read and write. And then there were the conservative and it just collapsed. But, but Parsons, Spees, those people that actually were executed, they came to Grand Rapids and gave talks. We had two branches of Germans in Grand Rapids that were the International Working Men's Association, which was Karl Marx. This is, you'd be amazed about Grand Rapids.
Have I put anybody to sleep yet? I hope not. Okay, yes, sir. When does the insurance industry pick up with the labor union? Okay. One of the things you got when you join the Knights of Labor, you get a little insurance policy. When you join the bricklayers in 1881, you got an insurance policy. And I got it out of the books because I do a lot of the reading, the old iron molders. When a worker died, most of them could not afford that little 50 cents or 40 cents a month. So what they do is pass that very hat to bury them. And have you seen the ribbon? Did you see the ribbons up there? The long ribbons, I have a huge collection of them. On this side, it's red, white, and blue for the Labor Day parades. On the other side, it's black for mourning. They would put on their ribbons, they'd take up a collection, they'd get the guy in a coffin, and they would bury him. And you can see one of the ribbons right... Yeah, there was a... This one, I had a laser here. You can kind of see the fringe right here. And they would flip it over. It was a brotherhood. So when you died, you would go behind the coffin, you would help pay to get them buried, and the tools. The first unions had tool insurance because when you went on strike in the furniture strike of 1911, you went in and got all your tools and you took them and put them in the wagon. The company didn't provide tools, they didn't provide aprons, and you took them out. So if they got strike breakers, they had to bring their own tools. And when a building burned, there was no insurance to cover it, so the union provided insurance to cover your tools. That was one of the big selling points, about 10 cents a month. Okay? All right. Michael, do you want to bring us up to the furniture? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, again, you know, a lot of this uh, throughout, the, throughout the whole year, what you see now is this union right here, 50 people here. This is a big union prior to the 1930s. And in Grand Rapids Fair Plains Cemetery, to this day you go there, there's a typographical union number 39, which means it's a very early one. Because if you want to know, look at the numbers of the locals. Generally it goes number one, oldest, not always, but generally 39, very early, 1850s. There is a site, empty. I'm looking to hog that site. Anyway, it's there. And they would do this for people because you, you needed each other. You weren't making good wages, and the typographical union was the highest skill. Did any of you know what a, 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 a linotype machine is? You type this Rube Goldberg machine. We used to do it with our labor paper. <laughs> Clattering, rolling around. It melts the lead, makes a strip. You saw it. You put it on there. You put it on a big plate, and you run the paper across it. Highly skilled. They were making $5 a week in the 1910s, so they were right at the top. And did you know they had two political parties in the union? The blues and the greens, to keep it honest? Okay. All right, 1911, basically 10 hours they were working, wanted a nine hour day. They were Polish, Lithuanian, German, and Dutch. The Dutch were Protestant, Christian form, and in the old world they killed each other. They killed Catholics. They came over here, and that's why the furniture manufacturers hired them. Because if they're Dutch, and they'd been here a while, they were the cabinet makers. They hired the Polish, who were the uh, finishers, and they wouldn't talk to each other. They did that in the South. You hire white workers, and then you hire black workers to keep them at each other. You hire women against blacks. It's always been the same. It's always been, because you don't want them to talk to each other. Because they start talking, they do what, my friend? How many of you have been to the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in New York, in Manhattan? You need to go there. New York University, were you there? Did you go upstairs? I never got to go upstairs. Did you go and look up? I looked up. Yeah. What was your feelings when you were standing there? Tell us about it. Yeah. The women went there sewing. Okay, we have that. We have sweatshops in Bangladesh. Same there, there. You look up there, it's five stories. I couldn't remember, it was five stories, right? Five. It's now part of the New York University. There's classrooms there. But you look up and you think, imagine it. These are young girls, 18, 19, 16 through about 22. They lock the exits because they didn't want them going out talking to each other and they especially didn't want organizers to kind of catch them while they're on break. So they locked, fire broke out. They went out to the ledge and there's this horrendous, it's the, there's the things there. They went out on the ledge and they just jumped because of flames and they just started piling up the bodies. It's true. People died. Lots of people died. Okay? 
19, let's, let's go right there. And this is, this is it here. This is the monument. We raised $1.35 million. I can tell you, we started that in 91. It fell apart. We started in 97, and it's all been done by volunteers and bricks. And you can still buy a brick there. There's 3,200 there. Um, it costs that. And she represents the, um, she represents the, well, I, I don't know. I was, most of the, <laughs> Yeah, that's a long story. Anyway, all of a sudden my mind went like this and remembering all these years. She represents the Catholics. She's the young woman and um, she's supposed to be holding a banner that says Spirit of Solidarity, but we ran out of money. So we did something very vintage American. She's holding a shopping bag. Okay, I call it the shopping bag. It says on strike. But there's a lot of symbolism, and any of you want to come to Grand Rapids, I will take you on a personal tour and tell you all about it. So my email is this. You can email me, and I'll meet you down there because I do it for the museum. It is very easy to remember. Eugene Debs was the guy that ran for president. D-E-B-S, Debs. He was a socialist. Sock, S-O-C, Debs Sock, at Comcast.net. And I will tell you, all about why those steps, why labor is on an island just minutes of being drowned, because it always is. How labor had to go step by step by step by step by step from being drowned. How they've got a wall around it because they, the workers were like a fortress when they stuck together. But you notice, are they linked together? Not yet. Not yet. That didn't happen until the 30s. They're still Protestant and Catholic. They know they're an island, but they're not ready to go like this. Who is the worker of this is the angry Dutch worker. Because for the Dutch, and this is another myth that they went strike and they were so religious, nonsense. Nonsense. They were just very cautious people. And I can prove that too. 15 out of the 3,000 mostly Dutch workers crossed the picket line. Okay, the Dutch were very angry. They saw a good thing. They joined the Carpenters Union, four locals, in a very short time, and they hung out. The one thing is once the Dutch embraced it, they were in it for the long haul. They finally went back to work because they basically ran out of money and they were starving. And then the young man over here, and I'll tell you one more story, because I did the research for this. I was working for the museum at the time, and this is how it grew out of it. I went to this house with this guy who was 95 years old. He's just all wrinkled over like that. And he was a young boy in 1911. He was one of those people, get your papers, get your papers, you know the newsboys? And he heard there was going to be a struggle, a tussle down at the factory. So he ran down there and he was telling me, and I can still see him sitting in his rocking chair. And he said, I ran down there and he said, the Keystone cops, they had those hats like that. They were standing in a line. At that time, the courts were all against labor, so they could only have two people picketing. You can't do anything with that. So the women came down the wives, the mothers, the sisters, and the Keystone cops are right there. They're spread out. And then the strike breakers are coming out of the factory, so the women are just standing there like us. And he was telling me the story. And he said, as soon as the strike breakers walked past the police line, they hiked up their skirts. They had stacked rocks underneath. And she, if you go down there, you check and see if she has those rocks there. We did not know until it was actually cast in bronze whether Roberto Chenlo, the latest immigrant, was going to put those rocks in there. And I'll leave that for you. But he told me that story. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, did Debs have negotiations with uh, Helen Keller? With how? Helen Keller. Well, Debs came to Grand Rapids, and I think, I see I'm still a little sharp, uh, not really close with... Uh, Muskegon, if he came here, but he came to Grand Rapids. He came twice, Debs did. I have never seen a connection with Helen because she was, she didn't become, by the way, uh, Helen Keller, blind, deaf, mute. Do you all know that she was a union member? Yep. Do you know that? Yeah, do you know that she was a member of this union? I collect t-shirts. This is why I'm wearing it, not my 1911 outfit, just because to get you talking. I collect shirts and I'm really proud of this one. This is the Jimmy John's Workers Union. Do you know what union this is? It's the fastest growing union in North America now, under 35. It's the industrial workers of the world. No, they're not part of history. They're actually growing very fast. Starbucks, and I have this, and I just love, they're so young, and they love to come up with these wonderful sayings. Helen Keller was a wobbly. And she was a wobbly. That's a short name for IWWs. 
She was in 1911, and she was vocal about it. And boy, this kind, sweet, blind Helen Keller that everybody admired, suddenly they hated her because she's a member of a radical union. They changed their tune. Yeah, there's a lot of things. Did you all know that Albert Einstein was a member of union? His professor's union, not only a member, he was a charter of the AFT. So I always say, you know, you gotta, you know, even the blind understand they need a union, and the smartest people join unions, because that's Einstein and Keller, okay? All right, I have all this little things. Okay, can you go flipping through here? Uh, th this all is, right, yeah. this is Mother Jones. Now that I know of, she never came to Grand Rapids. Yes? What's that? Oh, this one? If you go to downtown Grand Rapids, right in the heart of the city, all you have to look for, there's the Amway Grand Hotel over here. There's the Marriott Amway over here. There's the Amway Museum over here. There's the Ford Museum over here. And in the midst of all these rich people and their things is the spirit of solidarity. Do you like that? That's how I raise money. I, you know, I had to travel around the country because I'm a teacher and I had time off and that's how I did it. I said, yeah, Amway, 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 anti-union, anti-union, anti-union. But right here, folks, they did everything they could to keep us from being downtown. Yeah. Mound, burial mounds. Absolutely. And now they're not away. Just merely And they used away. that in the beginning. The parks person who was very hostile to organized labor said, because I'm the director of the society, she said, well, you've got to get the Indians' approval. So we went and went to a Native American meeting, and most of the liberal union members said, sure, sure, just remember to put a little plaque that honors the turtle clan. We said, fine, no problem. Then when they did that, they came up with another reason and another reason. So finally, we got our act together, and we elected people on the city council that saw things in a broader view, and that's how we got it through. Now, Peter Sakya, you ever heard his name? He, he's like with the Voss of Anna, and I want to thank them because they revived downtown, so don't get me wrong about that. I just don't like their politics, but Peter Secchia is like them. He said in the paper, I have a huge file, he said he was so angry about this labor monument in the heart of the city. He said, we need business leaders, and that's okay, we do. So there was an article in the Grand Rapids Press about a month ago, and it shows all the monuments he's been paying for, and it's just like he's surrounding us. There's all these dots all the way around the spirit of salt. Maybe he'll get us so thick you can't get through and see it. <laughs> okay, um, I only showed this here because when I had my students, um, this is Mother Jones. Mother Jones, you all know who Mother Jones was? Started at about 60 years old. She didn't start out to be a labor activist, but she lost her whole family to yellow fever, and then she lost her sewing shop in Chicago. It was burned down. And then starting about when she was 60 years old, she started calling herself Mother Jones, and she became a labor activist. Well, who did she work? Well, she started out with the Knights of Labor. Because that's the one thing I want you, it's on there, a lot is on there. The Knights of Labor, this is radical. In their constitution, it actually says these works. Women shall receive equal pay for equal work. Do you know what year that was? 1886. Do women still get equal pay for equal work today? No. Oh. That's 1886. When it comes to working people, it's very slow. Democracy is very slow. Yes. And they did just talk the talk, they walked to walk. In 1886, this little film there, I was so hoping Grand Rapids sent some women. We had, a, we had an assembly, they didn't call them locals, of women, but I couldn't, I didn't see any name of a woman from Grand Rapids, but they had women. She was an organizer, they hired women organizers, and she did. She later was employed by the mine workers. And that's where we're gonna that's show mate ones. Western Federation of Mine Workers. Well, actually the United Mine Workers. They weren't. She went for not, both. She did both, well, but mostly They were the you earlier would, ones, yes. no, out in Ludlow. Yes, in yes, Colorado. in Ludlow. Where do you want to go going, now? Keep on going, keep on going. That's There's some old pictures. I think you're in some of them. Now, <laughs> the I told you I'm history now. I'm old because, see, in Chicago, if you go to the first floor, it's all about social movements. I'd highly what recommend it. What museum is this? This is the uh, Chicago City Museum. First floor, wonderful. Suffragettes, farm workers, labor, brotherhood of sleeping car porters. And I just had to take a picture of myself with the displays because I'm old and I'm history. So there you go. See, I work for that. You should have left the relic there. There, yeah. yes, exactly. 
That's Dolores Huerta, and I'll tell you a little story. No, that, I won't tell you that story yet. That'll be later. I don't want to confuse you. We'll stay in the, before the 1930s. Okay, just keep going. These are not organized. Agnes Nestor, she's from Grand Rapids. She's a woman who formed, helped form, and start the International Glove Workers Union. Mm. Are any of you younger folks into this new trend now, dressing up in Victorian stuff? You, you smiled a little bit, no? Yeah, what do they call that? What do they call it? They got a TV. What's that? They're all into Victorian stuff now. Well, of course, they have to wear the Goth long gloves. That she helped organize. She left Grand Rapids. She went to Chicago. Yeah. Well, the union was never more than 8,000. There are similar that's movements. Don't get she me ran for state representative Agnes Nestor from West Michigan. The International Glove Workers Union. Clever name for gloves. And... Uh, Yep, she came from Grand Rapids. Okay, go ahead. This is the, you know, this is not in order, but that's the Haymarket Monument today. For years, it was a statue of a policeman. I just think, you know, how history could be changed. Go back in the time machine and find the person, and I think it was an agent provocateur, because the thing was, they, they had had, um, the, the, the guys had been standing on the wagon, haranguing the crowds. It started to rain. All the crowds started to leave. The policeman came down. The police chief looked around and said, there's no trouble here. It left. And all of a sudden, when the crowds were just almost gone, somebody threw a bomb. And of course, it killed policemen and killed workers. But of course, in those days, the people who weren't even there were accused of doing it. The guy that came to Grand Rapids all the time, Spees and Parsons, and in fact, Parsons didn't even know about it, and then heard that his friends are being tried for this. He came back and said, here I am. I wasn't even around. They put him on trial and the other people. And there was no evidence linking them to the throwing of the bombs, but they had radical ideas. So they were executed for their ideas. That's why the governor, that's why the governor exonerated them. Of course, he lost office because of that. Okay, that's the monument. Now that's me and the farm workers <laughs> when I was about 20. It looks 18. like the 70s, Michael. <laughs> yes. That's me out in California. That's in Myers. This is in California. Interestingly enough, we went out there. That's yes on 14. We're at a table. That's me. Interestingly enough, the woman is from West Michigan too. I called her up 50 years later and said, do you remember that photo? Anyway, that's, we were all $5 a week. And I just threw that in there. I started at college to get people to boycott grapes, lettuce, and gala wine. This is the one and only time I met my employer. Have any of you met Cesar Chavez? He's been to West Michigan many times before he died in 1993. Well, I've been working for him for a year. I got out to California. This is one of their service centers. And so I'm walking around the corner of the building, and all of a sudden, Cesar's there. He's in working clothes. He has a bunch of people around him. And of course, I've been working for him. He's my leader. He's Lincoln. He's six foot four. Where he walks, angels follow. Well, he comes around and he stood only about this high. He's dark skinned. He's in working clothes. It didn't disappoint me, but then I came up. I came up and I said, hi, I, you know, and you see how calm I am. I never talk fast or anything. Hi, I'm Michael Johnson. I've been working for you for a year. Can I shake your hand? You know, not quite that frantic. Well, he shook my hand, and I'm going to show you how to shake. Go ahead, shake it. How does my hand feel to you? What do we call that? Limp fish. <laughs> so I tuck my tail between me, and I slink off. This is my hero. Well, I, later I found out, because he shakes so many hands, he leaves it like this, because you get car carpal tunnel. That's my one and only time that I got to meet him. Right there. Keep going. So, Michael, maybe you want to tell us, um, some people today say, well, farm work, you know, they'll raise the price of food and vegetables. Uh, farm workers shouldn't organize, and we should let the market dictate the price of labor. Absolutely. Can, can you talk about that? And same thing with auto workers. Very unskilled job. In 19, what was it? What year did Ford raise the $5? 1911? I think it's, I 12? thought it was 1919. I'm getting out of my... Yeah, it was my, a lot my, of there. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. It was, it's a teens. And he raised it to $5 a day, but people said the same thing about auto workers. All they do is put in bolts. They're unskilled. They don't need to. And labor said, it's not whether you determine that this is the skilled job or not. It's how much are you making off the labor. That's how it's determined. That's the big argument now. Of course. 
if you were to say, yeah, it's a sandwich, and you shouldn't get paid $15 an hour, they're really going for 10, but $15, that's no skill. Uh, well, maybe not, but if you're sick and you come in and you make that sandwich, well, we'll see how important that is for people spreading disease, you know what I'm saying? The same thing was said about auto workers. Same thing was said about type. every time workers wanted something, you can't do that, the market won't bear it. Okay? So basically we found out that with vegetables and fruits and stuff, the market did bear it. And that's what I was doing, yes? It did bear it, it did take, you know. They raised the wages, and it did absorb it, yes. Well, what happened with the United Farmers? Can you says, repeat uh, the question so everyone can hear it, Michael? What's that? Can you repeat Okay, his? is the afl helping the farm workers now? No, uh, well. These people? Uh, farm workers or the um, fast food people. Yes and no. The fast food, the, the IWW is not part of the AFL-CIO. It's, it's always been independent. And these are young kids who don't have a, excuse the crudity again, a pot to piss in, but they do it on their own. They organize, I mean, I just love these kids. I call them kids, a lot of you are, you know, 20s, 30s, because they went to school, they got college degrees like my daughter, $49,000 in debt. This is a real job. They need to make a living. They gotta pay rent. And they know the CEOs are making 10 or 15 million or 20 million. They can afford to pay more. They're independent. Some of them are backed by the same people as the union and Myers. Uh, there's about a half dozen organizations. Farm workers, there's groups of them that are farm workers. In Ohio is FLOC, Farm Labor Organizing Committee. That's a union of farm workers. They're trying to organize the tobacco workers in North Carolina. These are the women who just organized star tickets in Grand Rapids, Michigan. The shop only has 12, but the owner, he's a millionaire. And you know what one of their big demands was? We've got antiquated computers. We can't service our clients. Would you please change these? He went and listened to them. So they, joined, they formed the IWW. They won the NLRB election. The next day, the owner fired the main one. Because the laws today are terrible. The labor laws. Okay. He only fired one? Well, he fired the main one. Deidre. The two of them that are still there, this is the one he fired, Deidre. Basically, they took it to the NLRB, he fired her, and it was so arrogant because he waited the day after the election just to show that he could. Because when the NLRB comes in, it takes a year to two to solve it. Basically, he... What was his reason? What's, uh, because, 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 in, because, well, it's power because, do you all know the doctrine of, do you know the doctrine of at-will employment? Every state except Montana has at-will employment. Montana doesn't because the Western Federation of Miners used to control politics out there and said you have to have due process in Montana. It means that they can fire you for any reason or no reason at all, except if it's written into law. So they can't fire you for religious reasons in Michigan because it's written into law. They can't fire you for race. So if they're gonna fire you, I'm not firing you because you're Hindu or, um, Mexican, I'm going to fire you because you've got dirt on your shirt and I told you not to. That's all you have to do. What's that? We'll just get it out and say. Well, what they did with her, and I don't blame Deidre, she's told me, she said, uh, I've been out of work for four months. I can't get a job because he says nasty things about me. So he offered me a big settlement. I didn't want to take it because. I helped build this thing, it took them three years. But he said, I'm desperate, so I took the payout. And that's what they're doing. Amazon, Amazon's huge. Mm. Star tickets in Grand Rapids. Just a small group. And it's really sad because their pay wasn't very good, but their big thing was working conditions. It was just really bad. They, they had a lot of pressure and they couldn't get new equipment, new chairs, nothing. And uh, I took a real interest in that because you can see they're all young. But, yeah. Oh, wait, yeah, let time. Oh, they did. We had pickets and rallies and everything like that. But she, and she said, I'm not giving up. I'm going to come back and do other things. Thank you, Michael, so much for coming. <laughs>